Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRH show. As usual, in each episode, I'll be talking to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well-being. Today, I'm joined by a psychotherapist and a parenting coach. She's also a public speaker and an author. Beth Tyson, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here, Beth. Let's start off with you telling us your backstory, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Sure, sure. Um, so I lost my mother suddenly in 2005. And at that time, I was working in the corporate world. And I just found that I needed something more meaningful to do with my life. And so I decided to go back to school to get my degree to do um, therapy and counseling, mental health counseling. So I did that and I worked full time, you know, in business while I was earning my degree. And then I, uh, when I graduated, my first job was working as a in-home family therapist for children in the foster care uh, system, as well as children that had been, were, were being raised by their grandparents or a relative or were adopted. So I was working with children uh, who had been exposed to some type of trauma in their early childhood and helping those families to cope with all the mental health issues that were arising within the family. Mm. And in that role, um, I just was, I just, I found my calling, if you will. Like, I didn't know what exact area I wanted to go into after um, mm -hmm. graduating, but being in that role and helping families who were so vulnerable mm -hmm. just, just was like what I felt really passionate and strongly about mm -hmm. doing. Um, and so I, I worked in that role and I helped to basically keep children in their homes. So a lot of times the reason that I was being asked to come in and do the in-home therapy is because the parents were on the verge of having the children removed from their homes mm -hmm. because of behavioral issues. So one of my main roles was to provide therapy to the parents and psychoeducation on how to parent a child who has been exposed to trauma and may be experiencing symptoms of PTSD or complex PTSD. Um, often a lot of grief work I also did with um, understanding how grief impacts children and tools and skills that they can use to help the children heal. Mm -hmm. So I did that until I had my own child. And then um, I decided to stay home with her and raise her as a stay at home mom. And I've been doing that for the last four years while working part time teaching at Eastern University as a um, as a uh, co instructor at their graduate program in counseling psychology. And then I decided I wanted to take all the knowledge I had from working with children in the foster care system and write a children's book. Mm -hmm. so then I wrote a children's book for grandparents who, are, for children who are being raised by their grandparents. Mm -hmm. Also known as kinship care in the United States. And what that is, is when mom or dad, for some reason, can't care for their child. Maybe they are addicted to drugs. Um, most often mm -hmm. it's because of drug addiction or if they're incarcerated or if they have severe mental health issues. Mm -hmm. receiving treatment, um, oftentimes it's best to keep families together so the children will be placed with their grandparents or a relative. Mm -hmm. um, while I was working in this area, there were no children's books on the topic at all. Mm -hmm. And me and my colleagues really wanted to have a tool to use when we would go and, and meet with these families and these children, but we didn't have any children's books about it. And that was one of the ways that we really would connect with kids who were going through a hard time. Um, and so I decided one day I was going to write a children's book to be a resource for parents, caregivers, social workers, mm -hmm. teachers, and anyone who interacts with a child in that situation to help them know that they're not alone. They're not the only ones being raised by their grandparents, um, to let them know that the big feelings they're going through are completely normal and acceptable. And to also build empathy for kids in this situation, because at school, a lot of times they get bullied because mm -hmm. they are old, you know, or why are your parents so old and that they, they feel ashamed. And so the book is also a tool to help build empathy for different uh, family dynamics. 
So untraditional family dynamics and, you know, bringing awareness to the fact that not every family has mom and dad, not every family um, looks the same. We're all different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant message. So you predominantly work with children and parents, but is there a special, um, sorry, is there a particular type of um, psychotherapy that you specialize in? And if there is one, what made you attracted to that particular approach? Sure. So I come from training in like an eclectic mm -hmm. sort of diverse. Um, I was trained in all different types of techniques so that mm -hmm. I can choose which one fits the situation because not all, in my opinion, not all theories will apply the same way to the same mm -hmm. client. Um, and so although I was, I mean, I was mostly trained in cognitive behavior therapy as well as um, psychodynamic therapy. And then through my experience, hands-on with families and the training I received in my role as a family therapist, I learned the importance of attachment, um, attachment theory and how to build attachment within families of kids who've been exposed to trauma. So that is primarily where I focus now is on um, attachment, building attachment and trust within families to help them heal from the trauma. Mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. But I understand aside from working with children, you also do individual coaching. Can you talk about the strengths and disadvantages of individual coaching compared to, of course, group therapy? Sure. So individual coaching is different than psychotherapy. So psychotherapy um, or counseling dives deep into the past and mm. the, the really um, emotional impact and psychological impacts of the past on the present life. And coaching starts right now, right here in the present moment where we are, and then focuses on how to move forward and what you can do to move forward. Not that um, counseling doesn't also do that, but in coaching, you, you rely a lot less on the past information and mm -hmm. You try to find out, you know, what's what are the problems and concerns right now, and how can we, how can we move forward? Um, and so it's a little bit different. Now, of course, you still go into the past a little bit with coaching, but it's it's um it's more about learning the skills and strategies to help yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different. And then I'm also providing training to organizations. So um, I offer webinars right now because we can't do in person. Yeah. And <laughs> doing, I've been hosting um, webinars for organizations who want to become trauma responsive because there's big push right now for everyone to become trauma informed, meaning that they, they're aware that um, colleagues or students or mm -hmm. staff or whoever they're working with may have been exposed to a trauma and how that will appear. But a lot of times we're lacking the skills to mm -hmm. actually respond then in a trauma-informed way. So I help organizations and schools and um, anyone who wants to learn those practical tools to help them um, become trauma responsive. Mm -hmm. And for those who are not familiar with your line of work, um, what exactly is trauma? Okay, so trauma is, a subjective term so mm -hmm. uh, it really is it's a very sort of flowing and vague definition mm -hmm. in my opinion um everyone can experience trauma differently or some mm -hmm. things that might be traumatic to one person will not be traumatic to another mm -hmm. based off of their level of support in their life based off intrinsic innate um, temperament uh, of their brain and the way that they can um, cope with adversity and um, even culturally, you know, mm. there's things that are traumatic in one culture might not be traumatic in another culture because it's mm. normal. Um, so really trauma is any um, psychologically or physically mm. disturbing mm -hmm. event in your life that makes it difficult for you to cope with everyday life. Mm -hmm. That's how I personally define it. There's, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's other definitions out there. Um, and like I said, it's something that determines, the person determines whether it's tra trauma or not. Mm -hmm. The world doesn't determine what's trauma. The person, mm -hmm. the person determines if something was traumatic to them or not. 
by their feelings about it, by their reaction to it, mm -hmm. by the way their brain, by the way their brain has responded to the event. So it really um, is an individual experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what, what happens is that when we experience traumatic life events, we usually um, seek help of psychotherapists, mental health professionals such as yourself. But do you think it's also possible to be your own therapist? Let's say you've experienced a traumatic life event um, rather than looking for, you know, a mental health professional or psychotherapist. You kind of, you know, just tap into your knowledge and resources as a psychotherapist. Is that possible? I'm sure you can still, I'm sure there are things you can learn to do mm -hmm. to help yourself, but the, the power of therapy for someone who's been in a traumatic experience, the power of the relationship between the therapist and the client mm -hmm. is really where the healing takes place. I myself as a therapist go to therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, you know, the, the value of that interpersonal relationship. And I think that's what people don't, I feel like psychotherapy is so misunderstood still and mm -hmm. that it's not about going to someone and getting advice and leaving mm -hmm. there and then applying it. It's about the intimate relationship that develops between mm -hmm. you and the client or the client and the therapist and how, mm -hmm. how that, can, that relationship itself can be a corrective healing experience mm -hmm. for someone who's experienced emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. Th thank you for mentioning that because I'm actually one of those people who's, had, who's got preconceived notion of, you know, psychotherapy um, is, is all about seeking for advice. But yeah, I think you made a point that it's really about, you know, establishing a relationship with someone, you know, who's probably been in that situation. Now, let's move on to another topic. Um, of course, um, just like me, um, you've also created a blog. So um, talk us through about your blog and to date, which one is your favorite piece? Oh, sure. So um, this has been such an exciting journey for me. Uh, the blog has really changed my life. I, I was always told as a young person that I was good at writing or that I had, you know, strong mm -hmm. skills, but I never did anything with it. I got into, you know, college and doing my course at work and all of that, but I never really believed that I was, I was any good at writing mm -hmm. until I started my blog, which I started a little over a year ago. And the feedback I've received has been so inspiring and supportive, and um, I'm really loving it. It's not only helpful to the people who are reading it, but it's mm -hmm. giving my own uh, therapy. If we, you know, talk about the self care mm -hmm. things, when I write things out and when I um, get on to paper some of the thoughts I have in my mind, it helps me um, heal mm -hmm. from my own traumas in life. Um, so. It's really a win-win, and um, I love just putting out information to help people sort of break down um, the myths about trauma, mm -hmm. break down um, the tools for people that they can use to, to help themselves and their families, and, um, mm -hmm. and just basically trying to make um, mental health more mm -hmm. available for people. Um, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to add on to that. Actually, that what you said, you know, like you kind of experience a cathartic feeling when you're, you know, putting yourself into writing. That's actually um, long before there was a blog, long before there was an Internet, there was already a science behind it. Um, in, in the 1980s, there was um, an American psychologist, um, James Fanny Baker, and he introduced expressive writing. It's actually, you know, when you write a diary, when you keep a journal, um, it's, it allows you to process some um, life events and of course, um, move fast forward in the internet era, very few of us actually keep some, a journal, a physical diary. And so we, we resort to keeping blogs. We resort to, you know, um, documenting our lives in Instagram and Twitter. And so there, there's, a, there's a healing power to that. And of course, um, to those who are watching, um, Beth Tyson is actually one of my most active um, contributors in Psychrage, and he, he writes a lot of topic about um, trauma and about trauma-informed parenting. So do check out her pieces on um, Psychrage. Now, um, I have to confess, Beth, I was um, going through your blog um, before this interview, and I found an article where you said that failure can in increase success, and yeah. that, I found that a bit intriguing. So if you could just talk, uh, talk us through about that. Yes. So this is one of the things that helped mm -hmm. me get started with my website and mm -hmm. the book and all the things I've been doing in the last year and a half, um, mm -hmm. coming out of being a stay at home mom and 
feeling like I wanted to jump back into work in a career, mm. um, wanting to do it on my own and, and start my own thing and feeling like, you know, who am I to, to do that? Like, mm -hmm. why will I be successful? What's special about me? What, why would anybody want to hear what I have to say? Because mm -hmm. you're really putting yourself out there and those little mm -hmm. negative voices come in and tell you like, you're going to embarrass yourself or, mm -hmm. you know, stuff. And, um, I've been doing a lot of inner like discovery and self work within myself these last few years. And mm -hmm. thing I learned about was how failure actually leads to success. Mm -hmm. And that the only people who are, um, the only people who don't fail are the ones who aren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. People that don't fail are the ones who aren't trying anything. Mm -hmm. If you are out there and you're putting yourself and your whole heart into something and um, you fail, you learn a lot through that mm -hmm. experience and about what didn't work. And then you know that you need to change something and do something different next time. And not only that, but when you put yourself out there, which is what I've found, and you try something new and you, and you write from your heart or you start a, or you write a book or whatever it is, um, that builds your confidence <laughs> in yourself when you like prove to yourself that, oh, wow, um, I tried something. I thought I was going to fail and I didn't. And mm -hmm. that can, can start to change everything. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it did for me. Mm -hmm. That actually kind of resonates to me. You, you said you like, you know, like when you put yourself out there, people can criticize you. And I, I'll just share a bit because when, when I launched Psychridge in 2014, you know, um, right now I already have over a thousand views. And um, for, for the past year, I've been receiving like email every day, you know, like your, your content is crap and why did you publish this? I get that. It's, 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 it's like my breakfast uh, <laughs> when, when I open my email. And o over the years, you kind of develop a thick skin. And um, seven months ago, I started this YouTube channel. And of course, YouTube is a lot more harsher than, you know, yeah. um, creating a blog and sometimes they said uh, just just um, a week ago, I received this really nasty email. Like, why would you give a platform for this? Um, I interviewed a psychotherapist. Of course, I won't name him. Um, and he said, why would you give a platform for this one? He doesn't know what he's talking about. So I just say, like, you know what? I'd love to talk to you and you know <laughs> hear your views. So uh, what you said, if you if you don't really want to be criticized, don't create something and just sit comfortably and sip your hot coffee but yeah I agree with you that you know um success can sometimes be um, um fairly can sometimes be a motivator for you to be you know to better yourself and create something of value right. now mm -hmm. aside from you know aside from your blog I also noticed that you um upload free resources on your website so yeah. what are these free resources so those are things I've developed personally mm -hmm. um so one is I'm just starting to build that area of my website. Um, and so right now there's really only two resources there, but one is incredibly mm. powerful. Um, the one is a, is a activity that you can do with your children. Um, anybody who is experiencing anxiety could also benefit from this. Everyone's mm. feeling that heightened anxiety because of COVID and, and the climate of our of our world right now um, and how stressful that can be. And so yeah. on my research page, there's a, a anxiety busting activity for kids and adults to do together. Mm -hmm. um, it's a coloring page from my children's book and it walks you through the steps of how to um, mindfully accept your the emotions that you're experiencing and stay present with them and um, let them be there instead of trying to fight off the emotion or distract yourself. Mm -hmm or, um, or, you know, numb yourself with drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what we find in psychology is that the more you can accept the emotions mm -hmm. and, um, be present with them in time, they pass those feelings. Mm -hmm. The one thing we know about feelings is they always change. Yeah. And so, um, if you can really feel that somatically in your body and feel the fear and recognize that, wait a minute, it's just a fee it's just an uncomfortable feeling. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to harm me or hurt me. I'm not crazy because I'm mm -hmm. feeling this way. Um, this is a normal reaction to stress mm -hmm. that 
was built into our brains to protect us from mm. from threats. Mm. So um, when you can sit with it and acknowledge it for what it is mm. and recognize that it's not harming you in any way, mm-hmm. feeling, you know, will will pass more quickly than if you try to fight it off with denial or 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 numbing or any of the other maladaptive mm-hmm. tools that we <laughs> develop to cope with this stuff. So um I'm sorry, bring me back to the original question because I feel like Oh, the, the, the resources on your website. Oh, the resources. So, yeah. so that's the first activity. It's it's a quick thing you can do with your family that mm. might help you reduce some anxiety. Um, the second one is a free trauma responsive care webinar that I hosted a few weeks mm. ago. It's an hour and 15 minutes long with a question and answer at the end and mm. all about the impact of trauma on the brain and the neuroscience behind that in a way that people can digest easily. So it's mm. not, um, it's not psychobabble and, and mm. confusing. I, I really put it into layman's terms for people that are not in the psychological uh, health field. And mm. then um, I provide practical tools for, again, anyone who works mm-hmm. with children or caregivers or foster parents or parents themselves uh, for how they can rebuild that trust and safety within a child mm. who's exposed to trauma, because that's, that's the real issue. You know, everyone gets, um, Mm -hmm. gets, you know, all upset about the behaviors of the child, Mm -hmm. the behaviors that the child's displaying. Um, But it's the behaviors are the symptom. They're not the problem. Mm -hmm. The real problem is the broken trust in the sense of safety in the world around them. And if Mm -hmm. you can start to repair trust and safety, you can begin the healing process with Mm -hmm. the child. Mm -hmm. Now, Beth, um, you've already mentioned this earlier that you're a dedicated child welfare advocate. But if you could just talk us more about what sort of issues do you usually help with? Um, so typically, um, people are coming to me with behavioral issues with their children. So they may be acting out, uh, mm-hmm. getting into trouble, um, unmotivated, um, mm-hmm. unwilling to follow directions, and maybe they're aggressive. Uh, behavior, fighting in school, um, the list goes on and on. You know, mm-hmm. when you think of, you think of um, the typical bad kid at school who's getting mm-hmm. suspended all the time. I mean, I'm guessing that nine out of 10 of those kids have some sort of trauma in their past that's been unprocessed mm-hmm. and they are um, really struggling to cope with. And mm-hmm. so a lot of my work is shifting the perspective mm-hmm. on how to look at children who have been exposed to trauma um, that these aren't bad kids, mm-hmm. that children do the best when they can, mm-hmm. and if they can. And a child who is displaying a lot of unusual or, or disturbing behaviors, there's something deeper going on there. And if you look at how trauma impacts the brain and you help parents and teachers and adults understand that, mm-hmm. their response to the child is going to be different then, right? It will be less punitive, less, less of a punishment and, and what they really need, the child really needs, is that empathy and connection and safety and trust. Mm-hmm. And again, going back to the idea that it's the relationships that heal. You mm-hmm. know, it's just like we talked about earlier with, you know, can you heal yourself? Well, mm-hmm. yes, to a degree, but you really need that interpersonal relationship in order to, to heal to the fullest mm-hmm. capacity. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you mentioned about, you know, when you're helping the child, you kind of um, shift the perspective. And I was just wondering, is that what constitutes trauma-informed parenting? Or is it just more than, you know, shifting perspectives? So it's it's the educating. So trauma-responsive parenting or care is about um, understanding the, the neuroscience behind trauma and how it impacts the brain and the nervous system. Mm-hmm. And then strategies and tools and things you can do to parent in a way Mm -hmm. that um i don't want to use compatible that doesn't sound the right way but is like the most supportive Mm -hmm. way to parent a child who's been exposed to trauma Mm -hmm. so it's going to look a lot different than Mm -hmm. parenting a typical child at times um because you know using harsh discipline usually does not work Mm -hmm. these children um doesn't, it doesn't really work with any children, to be honest, but, um, it's, but, um, you know, some things that you would just normally do that just come natural and instinctual as, as a parent, 
um, or a teacher of young children, sometimes you actually have to do the opposite with mm -hmm. a child who's been exposed to trauma. Um, mm -hmm. So letting them have some control over their life and making decisions so that they have a sense of autonomy and agency over the things that happen to their to them in their life because so much of control may have been taken from them. Um, it's our job as their parents to give them back some of that control. Mm -hmm. um, and so that doesn't always, you know, that's not always an instinctual reaction of a parent. You know, parents, they mm -hmm. want to, they want to control a lot of the situation. Mm -hmm. I know that way from my own being a mother and knowing mm -hmm. what it's for me, sometimes letting go of that control is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And then another thing would be, uh, you know, it's kind of typical in our culture anyway, in the U S to, have a child earn your trust right so mm -hmm. you, you know you need to earn it you need to earn that trust or whatever it might be and with a child who's traumatized you need to earn their trust first mm -hmm. before you're going to see any before you will see any improvement um or any deeper connection with them um you have to earn their trust first because their trust has been taken from them in some mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. so it's it's stuff it's things like that and, and much more but just mm -hmm. to give so. Mm -hmm. And now, thank you for giving us um, a good, you know, snapshot of what um, trauma informed, trauma responsive parenting is. Now, of course, um, we're still in lockdown. You know, although some some countries have eased down their lockdown, and here in the UK, still um, researching again. Um, but um, from from a psychotherapy standpoint, um, what would you say? Um, what what can what can we do to protect a child's mental health during the pandemic? Of course, you know, um, isolation is not really something that we have dealt with in the past, even as adults. So, what would you say um, for for those um, parents and carers trying to look for ways to help their children? Yes. Well, first of all, that this whole situation can be a trigger for previous trauma. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're seeing um, excessively clingy behavior from your children, or if you're seeing them mm -hmm. um, isolating themselves and shutting down, you know, if you're seeing extreme behavior from your child in any way, know that right now this is uh, this whole situation has been a trigger, a re-triggering mm -hmm. of potential past traumas um, for for traumatic grief. You know, if the child has lost mm -hmm. uh, a loved one in the past, um, it triggers, uh, you know, it can trigger health issues if a child has had um, trauma from, from um, needing surgery or health, you know, health related trauma. Um, this can trigger that as well. And just the whole concept of, you know, are my parents safe? Are, are they something bad going to happen to them? Um, mm -hmm. are my grandparents going to die? You know, there's all these like survival uh, topics on our minds right now. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, and this is a big one for kids, even if they're not displaying anything on the outside, mm -hmm. please know that they are feeling it on the inside and they are thinking about these things and wondering about these things. Mm -hmm. Or that you can bring it out into the light, the less mm -hmm. anxious they will be about it. So initiating conversations with your child every once in a while. Mm -hmm. to say, hey, you know, I'm sure you hear us talking about, you know, COVID all the time and mm -hmm safety and being clean and all this stuff like I really want to check in with you like what do you think about all this mm -hmm. and just, you know and just say or or if they are acting out or you're seeing some negative behavior that seems correlated to the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, timing you can say you know since this whole thing started you seem to be really uh, struggling with xyz you know whatever it is or I you seem to be really angry ever since the quarantine started whatever it might be, like validating what you see, reflecting what you see, and then saying that it's okay to feel that way. Um, mm -hmm. It's okay to feel angry about this. It's okay to feel sad. Um, mm -hmm. We need to find ways to help each other through this. And, and just reminding them that your job is, is to uh, keep them safe and that that is your priority right now is, is keeping them healthy and safe and that that's what you're you're there to do to kind of free up their brain, take some of the responsibility uh, pressure off of them and let them know that they have someone they can trust that is, is looking out for their well-being. Mm -hmm. That, of course, that is for um, the part of the parents and the carers. Um, what about for the children? Um, uh, can you share some coping skills that children could, you know, potentially implement in their lives? Sure. Um, 
me just think here for a second of some of my best ones so I can. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I'm really right now. And I just published a blog on it last week. Um, I'm really into teaching children about affirmations, mm -hmm. some positive self uh, talk that they can mm -hmm. do to themselves, do for themselves when they're feeling upset. Uh, that was one of the things. So, you know, I've been through my own struggles with anxiety and mm -hmm. depression at times. And so I know firsthand what it's like to feel some of these things. Mm -hmm. Not um intellectual for me like I've been through mm -hmm. a lot of these situations and um and so one of the things that uh that has helped me is identifying mm -hmm. what it is that could be making me feel upset and then telling myself that of course you of course I feel this way of course mm -hmm. it's normal to feel this way given mm -hmm. the fact of you know the fact that we're isolated from our friends and family the fact that we can't go and play the playground the way we normally do. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we're hearing in the news all the time about people dying. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, given all of that information, it's really normal to feel scared right now and to feel um, a little out of control and upset. So mm -hmm. reminding yourself of that, but also some affirmations um, can be really helpful with, uh, perseverance and resilience right now so my daughter's four so this would be for the younger kids mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that she has just recently learned is uh how to use the word i can do this mm -hmm. as, as an affirmation and um so one way we did that and i explain it in the blog on my website mm -hmm. is just by playing a game of toss together and making it hard enough where the both of you 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 being the parent and the child uh making the game hard enough that you guys are not catching every catch right mm -hmm. and then you model for the child I, let's see if this works i'm going to tell myself i can do this and then let's see if like our average goes up like if it starts to become easier to catch the ball mm -hmm. and it really does mm -hmm. <laughs> it really does happen right so every time before i toss uh, before the ball comes to me I say I can do this and I catch the ball and then sure enough like I was catching mm -hmm. the ball more often right well the child sees that and then they want to try it mm -hmm. and then it's that quickly the next time she um the next time she found herself in a challenging situation I heard her whisper to herself I can do this mm -hmm. but you know it's really it's really sweet and um it sounds really simple but it's starting build starting to build that resiliency mm -hmm. at a and that positive self-talk mm -hmm. and of course Beth um, as you've alluded to earlier um, as part of your role as being a mental health advocate for children you wrote a tender-hearted children's book a grand family for Sullivan so can you tell us what's the inspiration for the book and who is it aimed for sure so the book was um, an inspiration from the work I did with grandparents and relatives who were raising their children mm -hmm. to to, um, safety issues in the child's home. Mm -hmm. So these are children that have been removed or maybe dropped off at grandma's house and mm -hmm. mom's house or MIA um, using drugs usually, typically, um, or in trouble in some other kind of way. But, um, oh, which I also want to point out that drug use, in my opinion, and, and addiction issues stem from unprocessed trauma as mm -hmm. well so you know i'm not here to put blame on on parents it's mm -hmm. to say that um, they end up at grandparents the children end up at grandparents front door because usually the parent is using drugs to numb themselves from something that may have happened to them in their life um so just a little, a little side mm -hmm. note uh but so the book was written from a child's perspective of what it's like when suddenly your whole life turns upside down. And little did I know when I wrote it and published it back in November of 2019, mm -hmm. that we were all just about to have our world turns upside down and feeling very uncertain about our futures. And so the book starts with Sullivan um, suddenly moving to grandma's house and not knowing mm -hmm. why and not knowing when he would see his parents again and really just feeling angry and sad and confused and scared about all the things that, that had happened. And in this story, he, he walks through the emotions he's feeling and um, grandma continues to be supportive of him regardless of his behavior. Mm -hmm. and by the end, 
built into the story is another wise friend who comes along and teaches uh, Sullivan how she overcame the feeling mm -hmm. she she had to live with her grandma. And so it's really sweet. It's all about um, empathy and mm -hmm. um, sprinkled in with some mental health coping skills, like doing slow, mm -hmm. intentional breathing mm -hmm. and um, using mindfulness skills mm -hmm. to cope with um, anxiety, fear and anger. Mm -hmm. Now, um, clearly, Beth, you've been very active um, in your line of in your line of work. Um, you're a psychotherapist, and you advocate for children's mental health. And of course, you are an author. Um, is that particular individual was the greatest influence on your work, or is that particular piece of work that really, you know, kind of inspired you to do this line of work? Um. So, what inspired me to get in this specific? Yeah. Well, basically, um, who's your greatest inspiration? My greatest inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. That's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> there's are so many. There's so many people uh, that have been an influential part. Um, I would say so. My mom. My mom passed away when I was young. I mean, I was an adult. I was 26, but I was, I was still before mm -hmm. I had been married or had a child or anything. And um, her death really inspired me to want to make more out of my own life. And uh, it reminded me that, you know, life can be fleeting and can be short. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was the best way I wanted to make an impact while mm -hmm. I was here. And um, I went through a lot of my own trauma and like PTSD after my mom passed away. It was unexpected. And um, I wanted to help other people who mm -hmm. had been through something like that. And um, doing like the grief, the traumatic grief work and, and um, understanding it, you know, you teach what you need a lot of times. And um, so I think as much as my clients need what I'm teaching, I need it too. I, yeah. you know, it's something I also need. And so, um, so yeah, I would say based off of like everything that happened, that it was my, my mom. My mom's mm -hmm. death was my biggest inspiration. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Beth, you've been working um, for um, quite some time within this area. So you've come across with a number of misconceptions about child trauma. So if you could just kind of, you know, address those trauma. Um, what, 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 what are the misconceptions that you've come across and um, how would you address them, those misconceptions? Misconceptions. Um, so... I feel like people are only now start. It's only now starting to be mm -hmm. acknowledged in like the general population about trauma. I certainly didn't really know about it until I was in the field. Mm -hmm. It was something that I thought about or came across in the news. But now you're seeing a lot more mm -hmm. um, talking mm -hmm. about this. And so um, I think it goes back to what I said earlier about how we the misconception is that these are bad kids or mm -hmm. troubled kids or that they can never be fixed fixed mm -hmm. <laughs> or that um or that it's hopeless uh mm -hmm. that's a huge misconception mm -hmm. um you know trauma doesn't destroy the person mm -hmm. or the child. it it um damages their trust mm -hmm. and you can start to repair help them start to repair their trust in themselves and the world mm -hmm. and others um, you can see change and positive change can come from that. Um, and so, yeah, the greatest misconception is that these people have no hope and there's no chance of them ever changing. And I just simply don't believe that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that would be the main, the main one. Mm -hmm. And is it also a misconception, like, let's say, um, a child... Um, um, they lost their parent or their grandparents is it also a misconception just to tell them that it would be better if you just tell them that they're just sleeping and soon you'll meet them or is it better to be you know upfront with a child that you know um people are mortal beings and then at one point they die yeah so, absolutely this is good this also goes in along with like how to help children right now with covid with the mm -hmm. of covid children need to hear the truth mm -hmm. and and that's a lot of what my, the point of my book was doing when I was working um, in homes with families. What I found was that there was a lot of dishonesty going on, not from a 
place of malintention mm -hmm. because, uh, out, of, out of a desire to protect the child. We have the misconception as adults that we need to protect children from the truth by making mm -hmm. up stories and mm -hmm. making it easier on them. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not helpful to mm -hmm. children. Um, what that does is break down trust, right? Mm -hmm. If they find out that, oh, you know, grandma or mom has been lying to me this whole time, <laughs> that's not going to, that's not going to help mm -hmm. them overcome what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's just be another dent in the trust mm -hmm. uh, that they've already had damaged. So um, mm -hmm. it was my role as a therapist in homes to help the children understand the reality of their lives, the truth of what was happening. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the foster parents or the parents, they couldn't do it. They just couldn't. It was mm -hmm. too hard of a truth to tell and um again not from a bad place or from malintent, but from a place of just feeling like they were going to damage the child if they if they mm -hmm. were honest and what i always say is that yes it needs to be age appropriate like you don't mm -hmm. want to start sharing um you know all sort of inappropriate things for a child to hear mm -hmm. um but you want to share with them in an age appropriate way that yes people die and yes you know bad things do happen Mm -hmm. um, the world and and sometimes life is very uncertain and and scary um, mm -hmm. but what we can do is find ways to get through it together mm -hmm. and so um for example my daughter she's four and you know we've had conversations about death since she could talk practically mostly mm -hmm. because of my mom not being here and her wanting to know her grandmother and why you know she sees my husband's mom mm. here and alive and she sees my dad here and alive and so she wanted to know where's your mom um and so i have been very matter of fact with her about the fact that, mm. that he passed away and that our bodies don't last forever you know and that one day he will die one day i will die and that's all part of life and if you approach it very straightforward like that kids mm. typically accept it very well they mm -hmm. don't think that they will, but they do. And um, they mm -hmm. see that's all around them anyway. And little things like insects, you know, you step mm -hmm. on an insect, they realize it, it died. Um, you know, there might be a pet in the home might be their first exposure to death. And the reality of that isn't going away. So mm -hmm. the more honest you are about it and just kind of straightforward, you know, our bodies don't last forever. Mm -hmm. And another thing for parents to consider or, or anybody who works with children um, is that children understand death in small bites in like in like bite-sized chunks so mm -hmm. you talk about it once and explain it and they're only going to remember or retain or like process a little bit of that because it's such a big concept to understand mm -hmm. and as they continue to develop usually around age five it all starts to click and they're like oh okay i'm starting to get what this whole thing means and what this is um but it takes multiple repetitions of talking about it with them um, naturally, you know, you don't want to like <laughs> force it on them, but, but when the, the conversation arises, just sharing about it and, and they'll digest it slowly and over time. Mm -hmm. And really they're very, they're fine with it as long as you're honest about it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with what you said that sometimes, you know, um, trying to protect the feelings of the child is not really ill intention. Um, yeah. my, my, my other example would be, you know, like Santa Claus, when we were growing up, um, a children told us that Santa Claus is real, not because they want to, you know, l l um, allow us to live in an illusion that there's really um, a big white bearded man that really gives care, but they just want us to feel good. Um, yeah. I, I think that's the same way with, you know, with death. You, you don't really want to say that, you know, oh, people, people die of cancer, or people die of tragic accident. But um, I, I think it's also helpful that you want um, the child to have a good grasp of what li li living in this world is. Now, um, let, let's move on to another topic, Beth. Um, clearly, you've been very busy with all the work that you do, but um, I just want to hear, how do you relax with your distressing outlet? <laughs> um, so, you know, how do I relax? So, I mean, a lot of it is, is the writing is very relaxing for me, like we talked about. I am all about being outside and in the nature so mm -hmm. like, if i could do nature therapy with people where like i take them outside and we do therapy in nature mm -hmm. that would be uh you know a dream of mine but um yeah i think that being in nature is really helpful to me i spend a lot of time outdoors walking mm -hmm. and listening to podcasts which is one of my other favorite pa pastimes mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, walking and then spending time with, with my close relationships right now that's obviously a much smaller circle than usual but um mm -hmm. when i'm just present with my daughter and this is something i realized the other day while i was journaling um you know so many times you put other things ahead of what will truly bring you pleasure what will truly bring you joy you know because you think that this other thing will do it and um what i realized the other day was like just being present with my daughter and mm. just really diving in and like soaking it up and just being with her and paying attention to her and giving her that time. Not only is it enjoyable in the moment, but then later on, I feel a lot better too, because I know that I've like filled her bucket for the day of mm -hmm. for, for like attention and, and, um, and guidance. And so, yeah, so I find that spending time with her and actually being present, not just trying to rush through to the next thing um helps me and of course it's not always possible because she's you know typical kid that yeah. <laughs> isn't always pleasant but um but yeah so those those times with her really help me relax and they help her relax too so it's a win-win mm -hmm. now of course beth you have an upcoming webinar so can you tell us about it and i presume because this is a webinar um although you're based in the u.s everyone is invited Yes, everyone is invited. Um, I had 300 people sign up for my last one, which surprised me because I'm just starting out and doing, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Um, but I, um, yeah, since the since COVID started, needing to find new avenues to reach people with my message, I've started mm -hmm. doing free webinars. And so this one, I just see so much stress around the new school year coming up and mm -hmm. how are parents and teachers and um, people that work with children going to uh, navigate through this really chaotic time in our lives mm -hmm. and so uh, I wanted to pro provide them with some relief and some tools that they can mm -hmm. use and some psychoeducation on anxiety and stress mm -hmm. and depression and and all of that to um, mm -hmm. to help them cope with the upcoming school year mm -hmm. so I've named it coping with chaos mm -hmm. uh, how to help yourself mm -hmm. uh, survive or thrive and not just survive mm -hmm. so something like that i'm still working it's still a working title yeah but something with that you know we're all in survival mode mm -hmm. right now and rightfully so you know we should mm -hmm. be um but there are things you can do to to make it a little easier on you and your family um, mm -hmm. why, why not give it a try Mm -hmm. Now, Beth, I love more people to hear about your message, um, coping with chaos. It's very, it's a very timely and relevant topic. So I'll put the link to your webinar on the video description box. So for anyone who's watching this and they want to explore more, you know, ways to to navigate these um, unprecedented times, especially for children, um, they can take part in the webinar. Now, Beth, um, what would you be doing if you didn't work as a psychotherapist? Hmm. I mean, this, what I'm doing right now is my dream job, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I love, I love being able to do this type of work. And um, if I, if I didn't have to work for some reason, uh, I still think you need meaning in your life. You know, mm -hmm. even if you don't need money, you still need meaning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm sure I would take a little bit more time to maybe travel or, <laughs> <laughs> or have more downtime, but um but yeah, I really, I mean, this is my dream job. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what I would be doing. Brilliant. And um, finally, you, you've invited us um, for your webinar, but is there anything else in the pipeline? Um, and where else can we hear about you? Plug your websites, um, plug your social media platforms. Yes. Yeah, so I am on all the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on Twitter as author Tyson, author underscore Tyson, and mm -hmm. uh, Facebook as Beth Tyson Trauma Care and Instagram as the same. And uh, my website is BethTyson.com. And I'm always uh, releasing the newest updates there. You mm -hmm. can subscribe to my blog and you'll receive then my newsletters and updates um, right on my homepage. A little box will pop up um, asking for your email. And then I can keep in touch with you with all mm -hmm. my latest articles and resources for mm -hmm. helping children with trauma.
Brilliant. I'll pop all of those links and the video description box. So for anyone who wants to connect you, they can get in touch with you. Well, Beth, um, it's been an insightful conversation with you, but unfortunately our time is up. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise. And I look forward to hearing more about your work and all the best of luck with your expertise and your book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for watching.